Well, I want to begin uh, by talking about in the new year. You know, we're, we're fresh. We're just a few days in. Uh, some of you have already absolutely not kept your resolution. You haven't done it. You made one, but you haven't kept it. And what is a resolution anyway? It's something that we have as a commitment and a desire maybe to do something different or something better than maybe we've done in the past. And, and a lot of times we have physical resolutions. But today, what about a spiritual resolution? What about some things that can be accomplished or done in the new year? I mean, we're fresh. We're just a few days in. So let's, let's talk about maybe three of those today where we can have a new resolve where we can be resolutely determined and committed and dedicated in the new year. So I want us to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and really I want to begin with verses 1 through 5 and talk about the fact that in the new year we want to make sure that wherever we go and whatever we do, that we preach and teach Jesus. That's found backing up in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, where Paul says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, we find that to be the power of God, Paul says. Look down in verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. Watch this. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message being preached to save those who believe. Now he says in verse 23, we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, it's become a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, it seems like he says foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, the Jew and the Gentile, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Therefore, or as a result of this, he says in verse 25, think about this for a minute, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than than men. And that leads us up to really our text today, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 5. But especially do I want to begin with the first two verses because here's what they say. And I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. But as Chris read a couple of minutes ago, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, as we take our minds back a little over 2,000 years ago, I want you to think about the symbol of the cross. I want you to think about the cross, and I want you to think about how violent that death was. Even today, the most heinous crimes that are committed, people are put on death row, but not one of those people are going to be put on a cross like Jesus was. Not any of those people are going to face what Jesus did. And the folk who are on death row, there's been enough evidence to convict them that they should be where they are, and they're going to have to pay the penalty of what they've done. But not any of them faced the violence of the death of the cross. But Paul says, I do not have any desire to know anything except Christ and his crucifixion. So evidently what Paul is saying here in these first five verses is this. It's certainly not about the messenger, but the message. And if we can remember anything today, we must remember that we have to lose sight of the messenger, and that many times is us with the human vessel in which we want to communicate the Word of God into the hearts and lives of other people, that we want to miss the messenger, but we want to make sure we get the message. And evidently Paul is saying that. Don't you see that in the first verse? He says, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. In other words, I am not a great orator, Paul says. He says, I don't really have the gift of gab. I don't really have the communication skills to communicate effectively the message that I want you to know. 
In some ways, it can remind us of Moses in Exodus chapter 3, where Moses was the chosen vessel to go before Pharaoh. Wow. Uh-oh. And what Moses did was this. He said, but Lord, I... I, 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 sometimes, I sometimes stutter at the thought of, of going before Pharaoh. And, and, and incidentally, who am I going to say sent me to you? And God simply said, tell them, I am that I am. So Moses learned it wasn't about Moses. It was about Moses being the vessel that God chose to communicate his purpose before God. And so in the new year, I want us to learn this morning that it is also about us being the vessel that God has chosen to touch people in the sphere in which we live, where we work and where we go to school and the things that we do and the people that we associate with and the folk that we communicate with. There's one last example of this before we go to point number two, and that was Philip. Philip was a preacher, and he met a man in an unusual location. He met him in a deserted territory. And this man was an Ethiopian. He was evidently a position of power, maybe of the treasurer in a government and as these two were traveling, the providence of God had them to meet with one another. And as they did, the Ethiopian was in a chariot and he was reading from the prophet Isaiah. That's all they had. They didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and Acts and the letter to the Romans and 1st, 2nd Corinthians and all that good stuff. So he was reading from Isaiah. And so Philip, the preacher, asked him, said, do you understand what you're reading about? And the man was very honest in saying, how can I comprehend it and understand it unless somebody be a guide to me? And so Philip began, began to be his guide. As you look at verse 35, Philip was going to say, it's not about the messenger, it's about the message. It says, and he opened the scripture and he began to preach Jesus or Christ to him in Acts 8, 35. So that's exactly what Philip did. Philip said, listen, it's not about the messenger. I want you to get the message. So in the new year, I want to challenge us to have the resolution to be dedicated and committed and to resolutely consider preaching and teaching Jesus. Number two, in order to do that, we're going to have to do what it says on the screen. And I want to toss these scriptures at you this morning because we are going to have to depend on God. Now let me back up and, and give you a little history of Paul coming to Corinth. You got your seatbelt on? Acts 18, 9 through 11. I want to read this to you. Acts chapter 18, verses 9 through 11. The Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. Watch this next line, very important. For I am with you. And no one is going to attack you or hurt you. For I have many people in this city. The city was Corinth. Paul continued there six, 18 months. A year and six months. And what was he doing there? Teaching the word of God among them. Corinth was a city full of idols. It would not be unlike us going into... New York City, New York, Las Vegas, Nevada, Los Angeles, California, Louisville, Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky, Bowling Green, Kentucky. You say, where are idols in Bowling Green, Kentucky? They're all over the place. There's one on the campus of Western Kentucky University. It's called EA Diddle Arena. That, that, that's a shrine. That's, a, that's, that's an idol. And, and a lot of people have worshipped those idols. As Paul went into Corinth, that's what he faced. And so what God told him is nobody is going to hurt you or attack you in this city. 
the city of Corinth. Watch this, verse 10, for I am with you. So God is telling Paul, depend on me. I'll take care of you. As we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, after we read, for I determined not to know anything among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified, here's what Paul says. I was with you in weakness, fear, and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So what Paul says there is, I'm going to depend on God when I go to Corinth. I'm going to depend on God because I'm not going to be able to hide behind this pulpit, this platform. I'm going to be out there among the people. They're, they're going to be able to see my knees knocking and my palms sweaty and I have cotton mouth from time to time because I just don't know exactly what to say or how to say it, but I'm going to do the best that I can do because God is with me. And I'm going to put my focus and energy on God and not trust in myself. And so when somebody stands in this platform, in this pulpit, we must lose sight of the person and the messenger and get the message. And that message that we're going to depend on God. Back in Zechariah 4 and verse 6, a, a fascinating Old Testament scripture that I want you to see. The writer here says, he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, all right? And here's what he says. It's not going to be by my might or by my power, but by his spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And so another demonstration that even the prophets of God would have to depend on God. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. I want you to open your Bibles there to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Paul, in this second letter to the church at Corinth, is very, very personal in what he says and how he feels. Notice what he says. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble, which came to us in Asia when we were burdened beyond measure. In anybody in the room right now burdened beyond measure? Well, I would think maybe the... Tenero family. And Celeste wanted me to convey to you, thank you for your support and your prayers and to keep the prayers coming. Sometimes, sometimes we are burdened beyond measure with things that overwhelm us and overcome us. Paul felt that way. And notice what he says about that. We were burdened beyond measure above strength so that we despaired even of life. Now watch this next line. This is powerful. This next verse. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. That we should, watch this, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. I mean, if God, if God can raise the dead, if God can raise the dead, what can he do in our lives when we face trials and tribulations and difficulties and circumstances and situations and people that dislike us and people that don't want us around? What can God do with us when we learn to depend on him? Write it down. Colossians, or Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Write it down. Trust in the Lord. Watch this. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, watch this, and he will direct your paths. When you do what? Depend on God. You, you, you know sometimes why we don't find ourselves where we need to find ourselves? You know sometimes where we falter and fail and we're just not as spiritual as we, as we know we ought to be. You know what's happened to us? We've trusted in ourselves. We've looked in that mirror and we've said, you know what? I've got this one. I don't need you, Lord. I've got this. But oh no. Oh no. Never can we say, we've got this. We have to depend on God. And the church said amen, amen. And then the third thing I'd like to call your attention to is this one. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18 through 25, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, that our aim is to bring more and more people 
to Jesus. Even though we are weak vessels, and from the pulpit to the pew, we are. Sometimes we think, how can I ever bring somebody to Christ as weak as I am? And we're all weak. We're human. But we have the power of God because we're depending on God. And so we need to toss it right back up to God and realize we're depending on God. We're not trusting in ourselves. We don't want to we don't want to compare ourselves among ourselves. Oh friend, don't ever do that. Cuz I've talked to so many people and they say, "Well, you know what? I'm just not as spiritual as brother blank." I said, if you knew Brother Blank as well as I knew Brother Blank, maybe you wouldn't say that about Brother Blank. <laughs> Brother Blank has got a lot of blanks he's shooting. He said, these things you don't know about people. They're struggling. They're trying to get through. They're weak. And so we're all human vessels. And we have to do what we can with what we have, with what God has given to us and entrusted us with. So in the new year, I want to call our attention in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5 to these three truths. Happy new spiritual year. And as you go about your daily life, preach and teach Jesus. You know, if you were here Wednesday night, Chris Robinson did the invitation and he said he found sermons in peculiar subjects. And, and, and really there are. He found one in a vacuum cleaner. And I believe he ruined every man in this church by telling that he vacuumed. Terrible job. Thanks a lot, brother. I've had to work out my arm this week and push that vacuum all over that floor. You know, sometimes I, I've, seen, I've seen sermons in dust. Matter of fact, one time several years ago, not long after Tina and I were married, I looked under our bed and I thought I saw Adam and Eve. There's a lot of dust under there. A lot of dust. And you can, you, can, you, can, you, can find, you can find sermons in peculiar things. But here's the point. We're supposed to preach and teach Jesus. And so God is going to help us to do that, number two, when we do this. When we just depend on God. I'm not going to depend on myself in this platform, in this pulpit. I can't depend on myself. But I can depend on God. And number three... In 2019, I want to ask you to make a resolution that you're going to influence one person toward New Testament Christianity and toward Jesus and toward the cross. If that person is incarcerated, if that person is homeless, if you go to school with that person, young people, you can be a beacon and a light in darkness. And I'm going to ask you to be that beacon. I'm going to ask you to be that light in that world of darkness that you go into every single day. 